So let me, so this as I said, this is a mural that is our history over the last 50 years, we're 50 plus years old, 50 and a half years old. This was done by Andy Chaval, Iraqi American uh, anti-war activist who just ran to be mayor of Washington, who's also an artist. And if you go to his uh, different busboys and poets, you'll see uh, murals like this, but this one, this one is ours. Uh, so I'm going to start over here in the 19, this is the 1960s, we were started in 1963, so 51 years ago. Um, but actually before I just start in, there's two principles on which we were founded that, we'll, that you'll see throughout the wall. So let me just say a word about this. We were founded by two people, one of whom is still here with us. Um, they both were people who worked at, at the uh, White House, in the Kennedy administration, at ages 27 and 30 years old. Um, one's name was, was Richard Barnett, and one was Marcus Raskin. Mark Raskin worked in the National Security Council. There were only eight people there, <laughs> and he was one of them. And uh, Dick Barnett worked actually in the State Department, but they were, they were both over there in the White House complex on disarmament. They left the Kennedy administration in 1963 to found IPS because they felt that the voices of the poorer half in this country and in the world were never making it into the corridors of power where policy was made. And they wanted to set up a place that would bring those, the truths of those worlds into the world of power. And they had two core principles, one of which David briefly described, but it's a term we call ourselves here public scholars. That's as opposed to, most of you are in universities and, and, and most of your professors would call themselves scholars. They're doing objective research and they're seeing where it leads them and, and that's scholarship. We have a different theory and it gets to the core of our theory of social change. We think things have changed for the better in this country and in the world most of the time, not always, but most of the time when organized social movements have come together. Concerned people, usually at the core of them, people most adversely affected by whatever's going on, poor people's movements, workers' movements, people who've been hit by environmental crises, coming together to form social movements and challenge those in power to make change. So our, and, and by the way, just to give you our evidence, I mean, from the last 50 years is, um, when I think of what has changed the most in my lifetime, and I'm 58, I was born into a society here that was deeply racist, sexist, and homophobic. I, I grew up in New Hampshire, and the, um, and the looking down on people who were black, and who were women, and who were gay, at that time was part of the social fabric of our lives. And it has been, the civil rights movement, the women's movement, uh, and various movements against homophobia that have transformed that. There's still sexism, racism, and homophobia in the United States, but it is so different now than it was then, and it is so much better now than it was then, and it's because of those social movements. So we set ourselves up not to be some kind of independent think tank that would do research and writing and just sort of tell it like it was, and hope that it would, things would change. We said we want our work to be aligned with movements that are pushing for positive change, and um, we will put ourselves, if you will, in the service of those mo movements. Now, we're not propagandists for those movements. Those movements don't say, okay, do this, do this. We work with them. We, we work hand in hand with them. They suggest ideas, we suggest ideas, we pursue things. I mean, to make this like give you a concrete case of our most recent piece of work that got a lot of attention, is about two months ago, some of our allies, the groups I just mentioned, said to us, we think you know, a vital issue in this country where we can make change if we get together is student debt. Something I don't have to explain to any of you. Student debt has been growing and growing and growing. And they asked us if we could help shine a light on this through, through something different. Two of our people got together and put together a study that looked at 25, they, they decided to look at the 25 public uh, universities led by Ohio State that pay their presidents the most. 
it's, it's obscene. Now, a lot of these universities, public universities, state universities, pay their presidents over a million dollars a year. And we looked at those 25, and we looked to see whether those schools were good on student debt and whether they were good on another key issue that matters a lot to us. Were they hiring a lot of full-time professors with full rights, or were they mainly hiring part-time adjunct um, professors who they were exploiting? And we found this horrible, disturbing connection that the 25 universities paying their presidents the most were also very bad on student debt and very bad on um, uh, adjunct and exploited labor, if you will, among their professors. And so we exposed it. We did a study that exposed these links. We used our great communications team led by Elaine here to help gut it out. And we got a piece of the New York Times. We got, they actually in the end did an editorial about it. We got pieces out through our op-ed service. We got a piece of the Los Angeles Times. We got a lot of media coverage of it. Leslie, um, our former intern, now Newman Fellow, did a beautiful infographic on it. Uh, Emily helped design a beautiful um, cover of this report. And we made a big splash. Uh, and these universities are now extremely defensive. Some of them have tried to counterattack. But it came out of, the point I want to make is it came out of our conversations with Jobs with Justice and other groups that are leading the fight to, to reduce student debt, get rid of student debt. That is public scholarship, and that's at the core of what we do. It's a unique niche. It's hard to do. It's hard to do in part because, because the way I think part of it, all of you are in universities or schools or have been recently, um, the kind of sensibility of people who do research and writing is sometimes different from people who are great activists. But most of the people who work here are comfortable in both worlds, and that's what we do. Uh, I went to a cocktail party the other day of the New Orleans, dele I mean of the Louisiana delegation of Congress, and there were about 3,000 people at this cocktail party, and around the room there were the logos of about 30 big corporations sponsoring this cocktail party, and who also are the big campaign donors to the senators and congresspeople from Louisiana. Washington is swimming in money from corporations and government, which is a lot of what we think reinforces the problem. So at our start, we said public scholarship work with movements. And starting in the 1960s, the two big movements in the 1960s, all any of you who study American history know this, were the Civil Rights Movement uh, and the Anti-Vietnam War movements. Both of these movements actually came together, and I don't know, an incredible man died last week, Vince Harding, who was the guy who wrote the most famous speech, I think, that Martin Luther King gave in 1968 in the Riverside Church, where he linked the movements of civil rights and the anti-war movement. Um, at IPS, we did that as well. Um, one of the leaders of that movement, in addition to Martin Luther King, who is uh, who's on our board, uh, is Harry Belafonte, entertainer, but um, also activist. Um, somebody who was here at IPS at the time was Bob Moses, who started the Algebra Project, but um, a leader of the Civil Rights Movement. But just to give you a little bit of a feel for the kind of work we did, um, when the Vietnam War started, which we felt was an unjust war, an immoral war, um, we got involved with movements that were coming up to fight the war. At that time, the big difference between those wars and the wars that we just fought in Iraq and Afghanistan is you all, uh, at this time, had you been your age in 1965 uh, and 6 and 7 when Americans started being sent to this war, you would have all been eligible for the draft. Um, so actually that, that made it a much more personal issue for people, uh, knowing that you or your brothers or kids uh, could be drafted. And so a lot of the activism, early activism against the Vietnam War were people who were saying we should resist the draft and we should do it in a nonviolent way. And IPS helped put together this document, which is called a call to resist illegitimate authority, that was a call to um, resist the draft. We were asking people to burn their draft cards and uh, uh, to create an act of civil disobedience, break the law, and got lots of prominent people to sign it. Um, at this point, a lot of young people in universities shut their universities down, uh, starting 66, 67, 68. 
called for big teachings. They said to their teachers, we're in this giant war. We're being sent there to die. Teach us about this. And it was interesting. I and mean, you can imagine, a lot of the professors said, I don't know anything about Vietnam. So IPS jumped in, and Mark, who's still here, did a uh, terrific, quick book called The Vietnam Reader. You can't see it if you're on the side of the room, with a man named Bernard Fall, who's sort of the leading uh, progressive scholar on Vietnam in the US at the time. And this was, this was something that students or professors could use in universities uh, to hold the teachings. Um, now, a key thing about this period, we were doing this, we were encouraging civil disobedience, we were bringing people together. Um, the President of the United States during a lot of this period was the guy who turned out to be the most paranoid president in American history, a guy named Richard Nixon. Um, and he, it's hard to describe the period, um, and I was, I'm, believe it or not, young enough so that I was, I was like a kid and a teenager during a lot of this. So my memories of it are a bit skewed, although I came here as an internship towards the end of the war. But there was a real feeling of the whole society was being turned on its head. I mean, civil rights was completely changing the way people thought about race. And this movement was completely changing the culture and, and the sense of authority. It was question authority. It was young people standing up and saying no to your damn war. We're not going to fight. Nixon uh, decided to fight back, but to do it clandestinely. He illegally instructed the US government to spy on and undermine those, who, especially, well, both movements, both the anti-war movement and the civil rights movement. The FBI really, I mean, its enemy number one was Martin Luther King, and also the student activists uh, of a group called the Student Nonviolent Nonviolence Coordinating Committee. Um, and for the anti-war movement, IPS was at the top of the list. He created something called the Enemies List. Um, Again, it wasn't public. You didn't know you were on the enemies list. And what they did, I mean, in particular, the FBI was involved in this. Also, he, he got the Internal Revenue Service, which is w what collects our taxes involved. Um, they, at IPS, for three years in a row, audited every single member of our board, and they audited us. And that means they force you to come up with every little piece of paper on everything you've spent. It's, it's very invasive. It's also completely illegal to use the government this way. So he was, he was breaking the law. You'll recall, I mean, he's the guy who was later impeached. But with the FBI, he said, infiltrate. Now, the easiest way to infiltrate a place like IPS was through its interns, who are largely not paid. So what they did is they would offer a little stipend to you. They'd come and say, um, please report on, on IPS. And uh, you'd go to an event, and you'd write a little report, and you'd get your little stipend. They had over 70 people infiltrate IPS between 1968 and 1975. They went through our garbage. Um, this was a period, the beginning of the women's movement. We had two prominent feminists here, uh, Rita Mae Brown, who was a novelist, who wrote here at IPS her first big novel, which if you haven't read it, is one of the great novels of all time. It's called Ruby Fruit Jungle. It's a coming of age lesbian novel that is hilarious and moving. And, and, and then the other person was a woman named Charlotte Bunch who edited a publication called Off Our Backs here. Um, the FBI would go through our garbage they would take out, this is pre-computers, you had typewriters at the time. The typewriters at that time had cartridges. You could take the uh, cartridges, meaning it was a tape that ran through and then you threw it away. So they would take the cartridges and they would recreate what we'd been writing that they couldn't get out of the garbage. They blackmailed, we had a building at the time, they blackmailed the woman who was, um, who took care of the building and who was there to close it down at night. And, forced her to open up the building at night. They'd come in, they'd get the mail, they'd bring it to the FBI, <laughs> they'd steam it open. I mean, it's kind of remarkable to think about your taxpayer dollars or your parents' taxpayers' dollars being used for this. For a group, we were totally open. Anybody could come to our seminars. We were openly calling for civil disobedience. It wasn't like there was any clandestine thing about it. And uh, among other things, they uh, it turns out that Rita Mae Brown was having um, 
uh, a relationship at that time with Martina Navratilova, the tennis star. They recreated the love letters between these, well, that was one-sided because it was Rita Mae Brown who was here, but from Rita Mae Brown to Martina Navratilova. Um, so, and it was very disruptive. They also uh, compromised the woman who, who filled out our tax forms and convinced her not to pay our taxes. I mean, as a nonprofit, you don't pay much taxes, but you're paying small taxes uh, to the government. It's illegal. I want you all to know not to pay taxes. Some people choose not to pay them because they're protesting wars. But in our case, we thought we were paying our taxes, and we weren't. And it got us in a great deal of trouble, but not through our own doing. It was, it was the FBI instructing our people not to do this. So we went through that harsh period. And I, it's just, it's to put you in that mindset. I mean, in the end, the country caught this. Nixon was found carrying out other illegal activities. And, and he was impeached. And he had to resign. And <clears throat> the government actually did apologize at the end. But it's a sense of just what the, the country was going through at the time. The other just moment, because um, these two moments in many ways, you know, they're, they're moments in, in, a, in an institution's history that, that help shape it. The other big moment uh, was that this was a period, the 1960s and 1970s, where across the world, the developing world, um, there were a lot of dictatorships. And people were being killed and imprisoned in countries, especially across Latin America, but many parts of Africa and some parts of Asia during this time, countries like the Philippines, too. Um, IPS became involved with movements in these different countries, people who were fighting for democracy and fighting to overthrow uh, dictatorships. One country in particular that we became very involved with in the early 70s was Chile where there was a democratic election of a very progressive government, uh, a president named Salvador Allende. And there was lots of experiments in Chile around poor people's movements and, and turning city governments into governments that worked for people. It was a very exciting time. And the US government, so again, Nixon, um, said this is wrong. I mean, when this guy was elected in Chile, we later learned the US Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, said, these famous words, he said, we can't let a country go communist due to the stupidity of its own people. And so the US set in motion operations to uh, help overthrow these governments. We got in bed with intelligence agencies of the dictatorships to help overthrow these governments. And in a very dramatic and tragic fashion, in 1973, this government of Salvador Allende was overthrown in a military coup that the US was uh, supportive of. Um, many of IPS's friends in Chile that we had made uh, through that period of three years of this very good progressive government were killed or thrown in jail or, or disappeared. IPS uh, organized a congressional delegation. And I was just with the two people, two of the three members of Congress who went down. They're, they're now leaders of Congress. One is. Uh, Tom Harkin, who's a senator from Iowa, and one is George Miller, who's a congressman from California. And they went down. I mean, they both said they were crazy. They naively thought that just wearing that little pin that says you're a member of Congress would protect you. And they went knocking on doors to try to help find the disappeared. Um, and they came back and helped mobilize, with IPS help, a, uh, the US Congress cutting off all aid to this dictatorship in Chile that had taken over. The guy who took over was um, this horrible dictator who died a few years ago, Augusto Pinochet. So we did a lot of work to, against him. And we um, worked hard to free people in jail. And one of the people we were trying hardest to free was a guy who we had befriended, because he'd been the Chilean ambassador to the US under this Allende government, a guy named Orlando Letelier. And so, Using Congress, and this has been part of our history. I mean, we work with social movements, but we work with good progressive people in Congress. Pressure was put on the dictatorship, and a number of people were freed in 1975, and one of them was, was Orlando Letelier. We brought him here. We put him to work here right away. He became the head of a unit we set up. I mean, here we were going through the Nixon thing. We were worried we could get shut down at any time. We looked around the world to, to think of a place we could set up an office. 
that would be there if we ever had to shut down. And it's kind of amazing to think that that was the mindset, but that was the mindset. And we also knew that the world's problems were global, so we, we wanted to form alliances with public scholars in other countries. And so we turned to the Netherlands, a country that has um, really stood up for free speech uh, rights for 500 years, set up an office there called the Transnational Institute. We put Orlando in charge of it. it its main goal was to study ways to reduce um, the gap between rich and poor countries in the world and, and rich and poor people. And he set to work on that and did a lot of great work. I have some of the original pamphlets he did. I was working uh, at this time, just starting to work at the UN uh, in Geneva on these same issues, so I was very aware of, of his work. Um, and the Chilean government at this point linked up, we now know, with five other dictatorships in Latin America and set up an assassination program to kill leaders of the opposition overseas. Orlando was working for us about half time and in his other half time he was organizing Chilean exiles um, to fight the dictatorship. Um, they, among other things, again, just to think of, this is just 1976, they rented Madison Square Garden uh, where the Stanley Cup playoffs are going to start in, you know, finals in six days. They rented it for a giant rally for human rights and democracy in Chile. I mean, you, if you, if you had been um, your age at that time, you would have been an activist, I, most of you in this room, for, for human rights and democracy in Chile. Um, and so the Chilean government, um, again, with the U.S government complicit. We, we knew about this program. It was called Operation Condor, the assassination program. We did nothing to stop it. They brought people into this country. They hired um, right-wing Cuban anti-Castro uh, people here in, in exile. And um, they decided to assassinate Orlando Letelier. And I, I just spent um, Friday night uh, with the new Chilean ambassador to the U.S. who's just come here. He's just given his credentials by President Obama last Wednesday. Um, and he's a guy named Juan Gabriel Valdez. And he worked at IPS at this time. Um, so let me just tell it to you from what he told me last Friday <coughs> night, because there were parts of this I didn't know. Um, he was an assistant to Orlando, um, the guy who's the new Chilean ambassador, with another Chilean named Waldo Fortin. And the, the, um, on October 25th, 1976, they, they were getting ready to go home. Um, Orlando had a car. They went to get in the car. The car wouldn't open. The lights were kind of flashing. It was sort of weird, but they finally got it open. This guy, Juan Gabriel Valdez, had been working with Orlando on an article, almost finished it. They drove home uh, with two other IPSers who had recently gotten married, uh, a guy named Michael Moffat and a woman named Ronnie Carpen Moffat, his wife. Um, she, worked, uh, she had Christina's job and Michael had uh, sort of Betsy Wood's job, worked in the Global Economy Project. And um, they went home and then the next morning uh, Juan Gabriel told me, uh, Orlando called him and said, okay, Michael Moffat has my car, he's going to come pick you up and then he's going to pick me up and we'll drive to work. And Juan Gabriel's wife, he was recently, well, I mean, not that, he was been married like two or three years and had a young kid, and his wife said, I need you to stay home with the kid. This is something any of you, uh, well, I certainly can appreciate. And, and so he said, I, I need to stay a half an hour with my kid. I'm not going to come in with you um, now, but I'll be there at 9.30. We'll finish the article and get it off. Um, and he said, well, I don't know, really pushed him. He really wanted to get this article off, but he said no. So instead, Michael Moffat and Ronnie went and picked up Orlando and drove to work. And right as they got to about 12 blocks from here, Sheridan Circle, 23rd, and Massachusetts, which is right where the Chilean embassy is, so it's a, um, the car was blown up by a car bomb that had been planted the day before um, by these Cuban exiles, and by an American named Michael Townley who um, had hired the Cubans. Um, and Orlando was killed, and Ronnie was sitting in the front seat and was killed, and, um, and uh, Michael survived. And Juan Gabriel Valdez is at home, uh, not knowing about any of this. Um, 
So this was sort of a second episode, I mean, right on the tail of all the infiltration of the FBI that imagine being in a place where two of your colleagues um, get killed. IPS immediately suspected the dictator Pinochet and we suspected our Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, and so we launched our own investigation. And um, one of our colleagues who just died last year, Saul Landau, carried it out, um, wrote a book called Assassination on Embassy Row, which is an incredible book. And Sarah has like four copies of it in her office. Um, and five days later, this is a march. I mean, for those of you who know Washington, this is uh, 21st and P. That's a gas station there. And this, they marched up to the Chilean embassy and went to a big church. And actually, there's George Miller, the wonderful congressman who went down with us. And this is uh, Orlando's widow, uh, Isabel. And that's Michael Moffat. And these are Isabel's kids, uh, one of whom is coming here uh, this week to participate in the five days of the Cuban Five. Pancho Italia, you can't see his face here, but he's got a beautiful long ponytail and he's a great poet. Uh, and these are the others. This guy right here still has long hair like that and he's one of the senior senators now in Chile. Juan Pablo Batelier, and will likely become the president of Chile I think, someday. There's a nice picture of him right out there. Um, so we, people marched and protested and cut off arms, you know, cut off more arms sales and, and investigated. And we, um, so this is one thing about IPS people saw, well, the one thing Juan Gabriel said to me that I'll, <laughs> on Friday night that I had never heard, he said, you know, for people here at IPS, this was incredibly heavy. A lot of people said, what? I'm working in a place where you could get killed? I don't want to work here. And he said, some of the people started to say, we got to get rid of the Chileans. The Chileans were him <laughs> and this other guy, Waldo Fortin, um, because they make us a target, uh, having them here. Another person who used to come and help uh, in the anti-dictatorship work was a woman named Michelle Bachelet, um, who's now the president of Chile. Uh, and so these people were, you know, hanging around organizing and a group of people here said, get the Chileans out. And Juan Gabriel told me that Mark got up at the staff meeting and said, I would rather die with the Chileans than live with these guys who want to get rid of the Chileans. <laughs> Which, you know, again, I don't know where any of us would have at that time. I can imagine people being terrified. Um, but we each year, in memory of Orlando, and Ronnie. Ronnie was like 25 years old when she was killed. Orlando was like 41. Uh, so he'd done a lot at a very young age. But we give human rights awards in their names. And for any of you who can stick around, we do it in October. Uh, and the last time we did it, we had a terrific poetry slam team from Split This Rock that started the thing off. And we gave the award then, I mean, we give one award to a group in Latin America and one here, and we gave the award to the Chilean Students Movement um, that were fighting to make education free in Chile. And they've just elected Michelle Bachelet, who was elected on a platform of making education free and increasing the tax on business from 15 to 20 percent to pay for it. And um, so we do that. And please come. It's an incredible event. Um, we can tell you more about it. But, um, but we fought for justice in that case. And uh, in the end, the head of Chilean intelligence who ordered the bombing through Pinochet was put in jail, as was his deputy. Um, they caught the people who did the bombs. Um, the last one uh, by, I remember when I first came to IPS in 1983, they came, this show, America's Most Wanted, came to us and said, okay, we'll do a show on this, and we'll find the last people, and they did a show, and you know, recreated it, and did what the people would look like then, and um, caught the last uh, right-wing Cuban. And so we persevered in the, in the pursuit of justice. Um, Isabel came to work with us and uh, ran a third world women's project here that brought 35 women over 15 years to, to the U.S. and we brought them around the country to tell the stories of their country. She ran a human rights project. Um, and we pursued that work, but our, our fate has been linked with that of Chile. And uh, I'm going to go over with a little delegation of one intern who's not here, Ima, who's Chilean, and Sarah and Mark Raskin. And, 
formally present ourselves to the Chilean ambassador um, and plan uh, things work together. So let me just say a couple more things here um, about our history. For 1970s, a lot of it was the women's movement, uh, the, the um, environmental movement, Earth Day started in the 70s. In the 80s, it was, um, when I came in, I was put on a project that was fighting against US intervention in Central America. But the other big movement of the 80s that Emily mentioned um, is IPS became very involved in this movement that uh, has gotten some attention again recently with when Nelson Mandela died in South Africa. But we got very involved in the movement that was called the Free South Africa Movement. It was a movement to put pressure on this horrible racist government in South Africa that kept white and black separate uh, in a system of apartheid. And it was a great movement that got um, we had one of the leaders of it worked here, a guy named Roger Wilkins. Um, we linked up with other groups to uh, the tactic, which many of you are involved in now on your college campuses around fossil fuels. The tactic was divestment. It was force our universities, our cities, our foundations, ourselves to, to stop buying stock in companies that do business in South Africa. Um, and a lot of universities divested of that. It was a pressure tactic to put pressure on these companies, uh, to put pressure for change in South Africa. Working all the time, I mean, as we did in Chile with the people's movements on the ground in South Africa that were fighting to get rid of apartheid. Um, so we did that work. Um, just the other two walls quickly. This one here is more the 90s. Um, this was a period where uh, I came here to work on a project that Orlando had started that was dealing with the, the, uh, the gap between rich and poor in the world. Um, in the 1990s, there was fabulous global activism uh, of what sometimes has been called the global justice movement, sometimes it's been called the anti-corporate globalization movement, but it was people who were saying um, the setup of the world economy, the big corporations, the World Bank, the IMF, they're bad for working people, they're bad for communities, they're bad for the environment. And we, um, what we did at IPS, public scholarship, um, we did a lot of reports and studies on the bads. Um, the co-founder of IPS, Richard Barnett, wrote the best, biggest, first big expose of multinational corporations, a book called Global Reach, which is right there over Raven, right there, and Emily. Um, the Power of Multinational Corporations. It sold over 100,000 copies and really catalyzed people into action against corporations. Um, we also did a book that's over there in the corner uh, called Alternatives to Economic Globalization. We laid out a big, beautiful, long-term vision of, of a global economy that would be good for working people in the environment and democracy. Um, that was something I got very involved in with a task force of 24 people from rich countries and poor countries. Um, one of the books over there, too, that's kind of fun, I was just with the woman who wrote this in Berlin about a month ago. Uh, one of our donors, this is sort of typical of the way things happen in the 70s, one of the, our donors called and said, you know, this is 1973, said, I, I just saw this special on PBS about world hunger. All these people are dying of world hunger. I'm going to give you $50,000 to solve world hunger. So we gave half of it to a woman named Susan George who wrote this book called How the Other Half Dies that was the I mean, we gave the other half to a woman named Frances Moore Le Pay, who wrote a book called Food First with Joe Collins, who, who uh, was working here at the time. Those two books were the best sellers on world hunger in the 70s and helped catalyze a lot of movements to do something about it. So for $50,000, we, we helped. Uh, I mean, world hunger is still there, but we helped with the struggle <coughs> against world hunger. Um, we also held big. Uh, teach-ins around these issues. I mean, the photo up here, and some of you may remember this, uh, in 1999, there was a big protest in Seattle against one of these big institutions, the World Trade Organization. It was having its big meeting in Seattle. IPS went there. We, we rented the big opera house there and had a teach-in for three days of 3,000 people. Uh, these are, this was kind of a famous march because uh, Teamsters got together with turtles. It was like the Sierra Club and the Teamsters coming together, labor and environmental movements. That's another thing we do is pull those together. These are pictures from these big protests here in Washington. We had big 
protests. Actually, one thing, I mean, that very vivid, this movement was building and building, and in September of 2001, we were planning to have 150,000 people come here to Washington to protest the World Bank and IMF that are just down the street here near Georgetown, George Washington. And uh, the police had bought enough chain link, link fence to uh, cut off 30 city blocks. And we at IPS at that time were at 15th and H. And we figured out we were in this old, decrepit building that if you went down into the basement of the building, they were going to put a one of the fences across 15th Street. And you went through this sort of rat-infested <laughs> basement. You could come up underneath the American Bankers Association, which was on the other side of the fence. So we were doing that. We were involved in all sorts of things. And then 9-11 happened and everything got shut down. I mean, at that point, there was no thought of a global protest. And, and that's finally what shifted us in 2000 to about 2010. IPS, the centerpiece of our work, our public scholarship was anti-war. Um, we got very involved with groups that were fighting against the US going to war in both Iraq and um, Afghanistan. And the other big conversation I had Friday night with Juan Gabriel Valdez is one of our tactics, uh, the person who led this work here was, was Phyllis Bennis, who's, who's still here. Um, we realized when, when Bush wanted to go to war, he wanted um, an international justification of it. He wanted a stamp of approval. And the US was used to going to the UN and just getting the UN Security Council to say yes to whatever we were doing. So he goes there with this resolution. Um, his, his guy at the UN, I mean, he sent was, was Colin Powell, who gave this famous speech saying there are weapons of mass destruction, which it turns out there weren't. But IPS got, we, we sat down and we said, okay, what's the UN Security Council? Well, it's these 15 countries, 10 of them rotate, five of them are permanent. Who are they? And it turned out they were interesting countries where there were social movements. So we started to organize to do the unthinkable, which was to help countries say no to the US. And the two Latin American countries on the Security Council, Council were Mexico, where we had a person here, Manuel Perez Rocha, who could help us organize there, and Chile. And at that time, the Chilean ambassador to the UN was Juan Gabriel Valdez, the guy who you know is now the ambassador to the US, the one who, who was working at IPS in 1976. Um, and so, we worked with Chilean groups on the streets. They got tons of people out on the streets. And the Chileans actually, in the end, said no. The US was so mad. I was actually getting into the details of this with him last, you know, on Friday. The US said to the Chileans, get rid of this guy. You know, this guy who voted no, get rid of him. And he was, they were forced to take him out and they made him ambassador to Argentina. He actually enjoyed it in Argentina. He wasn't, he felt very good that he'd been part of this historic moment. Um, and so uh, we did a ton. We helped bring groups together. We, we, we held a beautiful meeting in, in 2001 that coalesced into the big anti-war coalition called United for Peace and Justice. We helped with a lot of these protests. Phyllis did talking points for the movements. We did uh, uh, pamphlets. We did over there, we, we did a, uh, every month we would put out the costs of war to the US, to Iraq, and to the global, uh, to the world. Um, so let me end just by saying um, that's a bit of the history. If you look at our work today, I would say about half of it is in that mode of public scholarship. Um, if you look on our website, you'll see 50 core allies. A lot of them are movements that we do work with on peace, on justice, and on the environment. We help them with long-term vision. We help them with hot facts and studies of the kind Betsy did. And we do this help with their leaders that I, I'll be doing like over the next couple of days. And that's, to me, some of the best and most exciting work. And I would just say at the moment, a lot of that work is well, there's peace, justice, and environment, but in, in the justice area, a lot of it is with low-wage workers. We think we can really raise the minimum wage this year in cities, states, and nationally. Uh, on environment, a lot of it is around a new movement to divest from fossil fuels and invest in good stuff. Um, we're involved in that. And on peace, a lot of it is around cutting the military budget, each working with great allies. 
But then there's another piece of our work where we're just sort of getting truth out there. And I really want to urge you all to participate in this. Um, we've got sort of five ways you can do that. Um, and you'll get into this during the summer so you don't have to take notes. But one is we have an op-ed service. We send these short opinion pieces to the smaller newspapers around the country. All of you can learn to write these short pieces. Um, Deanna's now writing these pieces and can tell you it's not rocket science. It's just there's, a, there's some little tricks that you learn. And your voice can be heard in small newspapers all over the country. Another one, that's short. That's only 600 words each. That's, that's a trick to learn how to do that. If you like to write longer, we have something that some of you are working on called Foreign Policy and Focus. Org. It's putting out uh, every week a bunch of longer analyses of things going on in the, in the world. Uh, it's terrific, and we, we do that jointly. Some of those pieces are, are posted jointly with one of our close allies, which is a magazine called The Nation, um, whose editor is on our board, uh, Katrina Vandenhove. But that's another one. Peter Serto, so Emily Schwartz Greco edits uh, Other Words, Peter Serto, Foreign Policy and Focus. Uh, we have a piece that uh, Karen, who's walking into the kitchen, does. It's uh, journalism around poverty. It's called the Economic Hardship Reporting Project, but where we're supporting in-depth journalism uh, around poverty. So, and that's just going out through big and small outlets and getting the word out there. Um, and the fourth one is we, we are kind of the world's experts on inequality. We have a sub-website, which is inequality.org. And we, um, everything you want to know about inequality in this country and in the world is up there. Um, Betsy Wood helps put that out and an associate here named Sam Pizzagatti. Um, and then finally the fifth one is we do these studies. Um, and we put out maybe one every other month. So you can be involved in any of those things. I'm hoping that through your involvement here you'll get um, exposed to and part of the public scholarship part, the working with social movements, and that you will also participate in just good, rigorous, compelling writing uh, for one of these other sites um, and get the work out that way. So let me stop there and see if um, we've got a few minutes left, if any of you have any questions or uh, things that came up as you listen to this thing. You